Okay, good evening. Um, I'm Martin Murray, Head of Grants, Fellowships and Networks here at the Paul Mellon Centre. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's um, research seminar, both those of you here in the room in Bedford Square um, and those of us joining online. Uh, tonight's seminar is part of a series, Out to Sea, which has been put together by uh, my colleague here at the centre, Rebecca Tropp, uh, focusing on the influence of oceans and coasts on visual and architectural imagination and production. And topics have ranged across the series from cruise liners through to prefabricated palaces. Uh, the focus tonight is on tattooing, with two uh, preeminent specialists in the field. Uh, uh, firstly, we're going to have a presentation from Matt Lodder. Um, Matt is uh, currently Senior Lecturer in Art History and Theory and Director of American Studies at the University of Essex. He's an art historian, curator, writer, podcaster, and broadcaster. His research primarily, primarily concerns the application of art historical methods to history of Western tattooing from the 17th century to the present day. His first monograph, Painted People, Humanity in 21 Tattoos, was published in 2022. His next book on the history of Western tattoo industry will be released by Yale University Press this year. It's in the catalogue already, we're told. So it's not quite imminent, but November, November autumn. Yeah. I'm just doing final edits on it. So we're going to um, hear from uh, 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 Matt first with his um, presentation, not just for sailors. Um, there's then going to be a response um, from Gemma Angel, who's an interdisciplinary scholar specialising in the history and anthropology of the European tattoo, post-mortem tattoo collecting and preservation practices, and medical museum collections of human remains. Um, uh, Gemma completed her doctoral thesis at the University College London in 2013 in collaboration with the Science Museum on a collection of 300 preserved tattooed human skins of 19th century European origin and is uh, currently a lecturer and programme director for the MA Museum Studies in the School of Museum Studies at the University of Leicester. So we're going to um, hear from Gemma in response and then we will open out to the room um, and any questions online for, for the discussion. So at that point, I think we can hand over and welcome Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks to the Paul Wellens Centre for inviting me. Um, I did have a sense that I might be in the Paul Wellens bad books because um, I asked, for, asked them for some money, which they offered me uh, over 10 years ago to write a book, and then I never wrote the book. They didn't give me the money, so I haven't run away with it or anything. Um, but um, I've been doing other things in the meantime, uh, curating exhibitions, uh, including at the National Maritime Museum in Cornwall. Um, so some of the material I'm going to be talking about tonight comes from that. Um, and my, my two books, which Martin really kindly mentioned, um, Painted People, which came out um, a couple of years ago, and the next book, um, which has currently got the terrible but probably now inevitable title of Tattoos. Um, you have to title books now by what people type into Amazon to find them, is what Yale University Press have told me. <laughs> um, but... Um, uh, so, for the purposes of today, I want to kind of talk really about this um, idea of, um, you know, who has tattoos and are, why are they not just for sailors anymore? Um, this is a refrain. Uh, it's become something of a kind of cliche uh, catchphrase for me. In fact, one of the titles I was angling for for the, the next book was, in fact, not just for sailors. Um, because, because it is a, an irritatingly, at least irritatingly to me, persistent cliche. Um, let me just make sure I've got my timer. There we go. Right. Um, so, uh, of course, we have this kind of... I mean, I think one of the reasons I was invited to talk today is because we have this idea that tattooing is intimately connected with um, maritime life and maritime history, um, and that from its maritime origins, it has recently emerged into kind of mainstream cultural trends, cultural force, mainstream fashion. Um, uh, nevertheless, like, even in these mythological, these kind of cliched tellings, the story is also often a bit more complicated. I mean, even for example, this, this is an unknown uh, uh, artist, um, uh, popular print from the 19th century, late 19th century, um, where a, a sweetheart is uh, uh, getting a tattoo from her sailor boyfriend. And she, you can see that he's also got his own sort of matching mark. Oh, let's do it on this screen so I can see. Nope, where are we? There we go. 
one of those things that works very nicely in practice. There we go. Um, so, you know, he's been tattooed probably by her in return. Um, and so, you know, even, even in these kind of cliche tellings, sometimes the story bleeds beyond the individual sailor into their kind of life world. Um, nevertheless, right, the, the story um, is a familiar one, as I said. It's a cliche that you'll see a lot. Um, Melanie, <laughs> Melanie Phillips, who's a bit of a bet noir of mine, because she does write this same column about every three or four years. <laughs> um, uh, this, this last one from 2022. And in that, she says a kind of paradigmatic example. Um, this came out very loosely just as I was finishing uh, the, the last book, so it's included in the beginning. Tattoos were once confined to rough sorts such as navvies, convicts, or soldiers. Yet strangely, in a feminized culture where masculine characteristics are held to be an affront to civilization, tattoos have become voguish unisex adornments. And she paints this thesis that tattoos are emblematic of the collapse of Western civilization. Uh, you can go and look that up if you like. But the idea here, this idea that tattoos are kind of were once confined to sailors and sometimes also convicts, soldiers, sometimes bikers get thrown into the mix there as well, um, is a very, very familiar one. So um, I decided to try and figure out when that once was, like when were tattoos just confined to sailors. And um, so I think the best way to do that is just to go backwards in time. So this is from 2022. Um, this is from about a decade earlier, 2011. Once the mark of sailors and bikers, body art is now sought after by the fashion hungry. Um, this is uh, from a decade earlier than that, in 2003. Tattooing, once exclusive but down market domain of sailors, soldiers and bikers, is to become a permanent feature at Selfridges. Um, so we're already 20 years in the past. Um, this is from 1982. Uh, all sorts of people are doing it. Lecturers, housewives, skinheads, architects, pop stars and sailors, the old and the young, all classes and sexes. If the very word tattoo makes you think of servicemen, Victorian freak shows, sleazy pornography, the exotic East or hepatitis, you are out of date. Um, this was written about two years after I was born. Um, this is from the 1970s. No tugboat annies these, nor women who work for Barnum and Bailey. One tattooed lady is an attorney, another banker, a third a writer, and the th fourth a mother of three. Um, this is in the client base of an American tattooer called Lyle Tuttle. Um, okay, so we're already back uh, 50 years from today. Um, can we go back further? Of course we can. This is from the 1930s. Tattooing a la mode, fashions change in tattooing. Sailors among civilized people, the chief patrons of the art, were once disposed to display, display anchors, hearts, and tracks transfixed by Cupid's darts. Now it appears American youths have pictures of feminine film stars on their chests. Um, 1930s, maybe we go back to 1920s. This is my favorite. So we're now 100 years ago, Melanie Phillips. Um, this is one of my favorites. I cite it all the time. Um, tattooing has passed from the savage to the sailor, from the sailor to the landsman. It's since percolated through the entire social spectrum. Tattooing has found its credentials and may now be found beneath many a tailored shirt. Um, you can see how irritated I get, right, when these come up all the time. But we can keep going back, right? This is 1926. Um, this is from 1908. Oop. There we go. Um, one of my favourites, um, Habit Not Confined to Seamen Only, um, which I, I like as a kind of um, Edwardian version of this. Um, uh, and we, ca we can even go back, and the, the, the earliest examples of these are about in the 1880s, so even about 20 years earlier than this. So we can go back, you know, over 100, maybe even over 120 years when to find the once when tattooing was just for sailors. And in fact, um, the professional tattoo industry, uh, that is the kind of trading of money to a stranger to get tattooed, although it has some roots back into the early 18th century, until about 1719. Um, the beginning of the tattoo industry in uh, London in the uh, early 1880s is basically... Um, hailed as this beginning of, of the move away from tattooing into the fashionable realm. So when we understand, right, that we have this cliche, I think a more interesting question becomes, why is it so persistent? Um, other than the fact that maybe journalists are lazy um, <laughs> and don't do their research. Um, why is it that despite the fact that up journalists and um, uh, have been reporting on both sides of the Atlantic that tattooing used to be one thing and is now something else for such a long time, the idea persists, right, that tattooing is this 
sort of stubbornly maritime practice. And in a way, a, a lot of my work over the past um, sort of decade or more have been trying to actually answer that more interesting question, I think, like, what is the gap between the, so the popular understanding uh, and the academic understanding and the, 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 the sort of facts on the ground as we see them? Um, and it's a difficult question to research, really. It's a difficult question to unpick. Um, one of the reasons, or perhaps the most obvious reason for the persistence of this cliche is simply the fact that tattoos um, aren't particularly persistent. Um, Gemma uh, in the audience here um, named her blog Life and Six Months um, after a quote from a tattoo artist from, uh, who I'll come back to in a minute called Samuel Stewart who wrote that you know, tattooing is a mayfly art. Uh, it lasts for life plus six months as it rots away in the ground. Um, other than in, the, you know, in rare examples that, that Gemma um, knows much more about than I do, uh, tattooing you know, doesn't tend to have a museum afterlife. And so when we're looking for tattoos, we're looking um, in a very sort of limited pool of evidence. And of course, um, the, 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 the main place that we can go looking for tattoos in the archive is on surveilled populations. Right? People who have their bodies systematically recorded for various purposes. And those are, of course, primarily enlisted military men, sailors, and prisoners whose bodies are um, documented, whose tattoos and identifying marks are logged in record books and other uh, means in order to aid identification. And so the kind of tattoos that survive in the archive are sailor tattoos and criminal tattoos primarily. Um, there's an interesting um, gap as well in that those people, um, sailors and criminals, are not kind of, they're not often the kind of people that have historically sat for portraiture. Um, the, uh, the, um, there are some rare examples, actually. This is from McLeese's Death of Nelson Watergloss mural uh, series, which is in the House of Lords, um, recording... Uh, or depicting at least tattoos purportedly at the Battle of Waterloo and Battle of Trafalgar. Um, McLeese was a very sort of studied draftsman. He, he interviewed veterans um, from the campaigns, even though the, the painting was completed about 50, 40, 50 years after the, the, the battle. Um, and, but in, so this is a rare example where the tattoos actually are um, recorded or, 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 uh, or, or depicted at least. And there's many of them throughout the... Um, murals, particularly in the Trafalgar one, actually. Um, but these are kind of rare, right? The, the, the portraits from life or portraits that act accurately reflect um, tattooed populations before the era of photography are particularly rare. Um, and even actually in the era of photography, some early photographic techniques don't adequately reproduce tattoos, um, adding another complex layer to the story. Um, so instead, we have to kind of go on enlistment certificates, on um, uh, service records, um, and in those we do find a, a lot of evidence of sailor tattooing, right? This is actually from a really seminal article from the 80s by a guy called Ira Dye, who recorded huge amounts of tattooing amongst American seafarers at the end of the 18th century. Um, in Britain, um, this guy Edward Rotherham did a survey of uh, enlisted men aboard HMS Bellophoron uh, between the, eight, the end of the 18th century and 1808. And he estimated that about 60% of the men in his um, service had tattoos. Um, and many of them are described here in um, fairly kind of perfunctory but straightforward ways. You know, um, man and woman on left, crucifix, TW, the initials, a pierced heart and anchor, right forearm. Some of them are of, of that kind. Some of them are much more kind of extensive. Um, here we have a centaur, MS and a heart on left, crucifix, sun, moon and stars on right arm. Um, Ira Dye actually develops a kind of topology for these. Um, and he basically says that, that most of the tattoos in these record sets are, are almost overwhelmingly either names and initials, um, things of love, uh, hearts and, and sweetheart tokens, things of the sea, so images representing maritime service, um, or religious imagery or um, kind of magical imagery like that centaur. Um, so that's the, that's the sailors. Um, there's also a, a slight, again, kind of historical wrinkle there that that kind of record keeping, that kind of systematic 
record keeping begins with the Napoleonic Wars. So at this moment in time, for a reason, again, that I will return to shortly, tattooing becomes um, documented in a particularly systematic way that is rare beforehand. Um, criminals, the same, um, criminals often have their tattoos recorded on enlistment, partly, of course, to mitigate against people trying to use fake identities. Um, it was also used fairly uh, loosely to try and work out any kind of criminal fratern fraternalization or, or links between various individuals. Um, sometimes you get, and I love, um, God bless these people from, uh, from history who sort of fancy themselves a bit more creative than just writing down, and they have a go at sketching out the designs. So we've got these little kind of um, sketches uh, on enlistment, and there's another one here that I love here. Right. Um, so and, so, and even in these um, prison records, you often get people with these kind of maritime-esque images, right? Um, and the other uh, evidence set, again, as I mentioned, is, is preserved tattooed skins. Um, and again, those, again, by their nature, the, the way that preserved body, any body parts enter collections is often from people who die in state custody, right? People who die and are... Um, whose bodies have at least some degree of control over them from the state, uh, again, primarily including sailors and criminals. So even in this kind of record set, um, the physical evidence of tattooing, the lens upon which we view it is primarily focused on um, those subcategories, right? The more vernacular history of tattooing is visible in these record sets if you comb them very hard um, and you look sort of and think beyond the... The, the circular reasoning, but um, that's a complicated and difficult job to do. Um, so that creates this idea, as I said, that tattooing is you know, primarily something that was in the past exclusively done by sailors and soldiers. Um, it also creates this temporal lens, which really begins at the end of the 18th century. Um, uh, coincident with the encounters with um, tattooed populations in the Pacific, um, places like New Zealand, Maori, uh, Fiji, Samoa, Tahiti. Um, again, in, for, for something that I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll go into shallowly here, but is in my book in much more detail, um, that is uh, really an idea that only develops, the idea that tattooing was discovered in the Pacific only really um, comes about in the, like, early 20th century, um, certainly Captain Cook and, and Joseph Banks and others on the Endeavour Voyages did not believe that tattooing was an entirely novel technology to Europeans. Um, you know, uh, sailors themselves actually understood that pricking of ink into the skin was an ancient custom um, here in a 19th century engraving. Um, but... There is something um, you know, particular about the kind of tattooing that was encountered in New Zealand that, that was surprising to Europeans. So um, even you know, writers like Immanuel Kant were writing about the tattooing that was encountered in, in the Pacific, particularly because it was large, it was black, and it was often facial, um, kind of shocking and surprising to Europeans. Europeans and uh, European um, historians and antiquarians had documented tattooing uh, through um, Roman and Greek sources and through the documentation and visits of tattooed peoples from native North America since the late 15th century. Um, and in fact, as I again I talk about in Painted People, there was a portrait of a tattooed woman, uh, Meacock, from um, uh, modern-day Labrador in Canada, hanging on the walls of the National Portrait Gallery, uh, sorry, the Royal Academy, the day that Captain Cook first set foot uh, in Tahiti. Um, but what was surprising was this particular kind of um, uh, indigenous practice of the Pacific. And actually, the other reason, aside from this archival lens that tattooing has this p persistent stigmatization is because the at this point in the 18th century the colonial project is changing so when tattoos were discussed uh, although they weren't called tattoos at the time but when the skin marking on indigenous uh, native north americans was discussed in the um, 16th century it was as a humanizing uh, mode right there was this idea that um the inhabitants of Great Britannia had in times been as past as savage as those of Virginia. The idea, um, based on, as I said, Roman sources, 
uh, that ancient Britons had tattoos. They probably didn't. That's a story for another day, but certainly antiquarian Britons definitely thought they did. Um, the fact that people in the New World had tattoos was a way of saying, look, these people in the New World are just like us. Um, the colonial project of the 18th century had changed all that, and, and tattooing became, in um, the discourse, something of othering, right? something that distinguished non-European populations from Europeans. Um, when uh, when um, you know, Sidney Parkinson uh, observed tattooing and was tattooed in Tahiti, Joseph Banks was also tattooed in Tahiti, um, and documented and brought back artefacts uh, quite extensively. Um, however, as I said, like the, the standard story is that that is what caused the take up of sailor tattooing, right? You'll read academic texts that say. Sailors went, they saw this amazing thing they hadn't ever seen before, and they copied it, and, and that's what made tattooing so popular amongst maritime populations. Um, however, um, as I said, sailors themselves certainly acknowledge that, you know, as per this article from the Literary Gazette, um, European seamen have been from time immemorial marked themselves with a kind of tattooing by pricking their arms, legs, and sometimes other parts of their bodies, um, single figures, for instance, cross letters or names. And actually, what doesn't happen is that you find lots of European uh, sailors coming home with Pacific-style tattooing. Some do, um, but it's a very, very small minority. And in fact, the, the examples of, of skin marking pre and post that 18th century moment um, are basically equivalent. Like, far from being the birth of a new practice, the Pacific encounter basically didn't change, Pacific tattoo, uh, didn't change European tattooing at all. Um, and we can see that, I mean, um, archive sources like this are, are recently becoming easier to find thanks to digitized corpuses. And here's one from 1739 um, from the uh, Virginia Gazette in the American colonies. About three decades, uh, two and a half decades before the Cook voyages, um, and it describes uh, here basically someone trying to find their, their indentured servant who'd run away from the subscriber, um, a servant man named John Hedford, an Englishman, middle-aged, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can see here uh, on one of his arms is represented our saviour upon the cross between two thieves, on the other the image of Adam and Eve. So those kind of religious tattoos, for example, that um, Ira Dye, uh, documented in the American um, semen record sets include many designs described in exactly the same way. He professes himself a cook. Um, here's another one um, where we have uh, this man has a great many letters and figures on his breast and left arm in red and some in black. Um, so that's pretty unequivocal, I think, um, but we can kind of find a few more. This is... Um, a really, probably the most extensively tattooed um, Englishman in the 18th century that we've yet found example of. I tried to find out his name, but the records weren't particularly good. I think his name is William. Anyway, um, again, more about that in Painted People. The, um, this boy, uh, 15 years of age, convicted of stealing weights out of a saddler's shop, or perhaps in other versions, a salter's shop in the borough from a natural propensity to villainy, had on his breast, marked with Indian ink, the portraiture of a man at length, with a sword drawn in one hand and a pistol discharging balls from the muzzle in the other, with a label in the man's mouth, God damn you stand. Right? Um, so full chess piece, probably copied from a broadside. Um, and so, you know, these, these men are not straightforwardly sailors, I think, and they had at least the previous two had been to sea. Um, uh, but we can even kind of look a, a century earlier than that, back into the, 1700, uh, the 17th century, in the 1600s, and think about pilgrim tattooing. And pilgrims are another really, really good source of a kind of uh, long history of this practice. Many pilgrims starting in the middle of the 16th century were tattooed in Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Loretto in Italy, um, with marks of their pilgrimage. It's a practice that seems to have developed actually in Italy in the middle of the 16th century, uh, perhaps as a sort of artifact uh, of medicinal bloodletting. Uh, people were getting um, cupping and... and, and, and um, uh, lancet pricks and things, and when they were he being healed with mineral muds, some of that created marks, and um, so we know from a few surviving 16th century sources that became um, adapted for making of religious marks in the 1550s. Um, 
And again, the image uh, world, the vernacular image world of this stuff is very, very persistent and persists through the Cook voyages. Um, even the technology does. So those, these pilgrim stamps are done with these hand-carved wooden blocks um, used to transfer the designs uh, in ink, and then they're pricked over by hand. Um, and those blocks were still being used by early professional tattooers in London in the 1880s. Um, we even have, uh, this is from uh, Italy, from the 1750s, a Venetian tattooer um, who explained to the um, uh, painter of this image, uh, Jan van Grevenbruck, that the, he had learned, or his, you know, the, the culture of tattooing had been learned by the Italians from the ancient Greeks. And you can see here again these wood blocks being used as designs. Um, in fact, the earliest professional tattooer that we have yet identified or sort of person claiming to be a professional um, in England is a housebreaker who was um, arrested in 1719 and claimed um, when he was arrested that his business was to make the Jerusalem mark, so do pilgrimage tattoos back in London. So in some senses, the, the, the pilgrimage tattooing and the religious tattooing predates in the evidentiary record the, the sailor tattoo. Um, as I said, there are some people, like this guy here, William uh, uh, Torrey, who did kind of become what my friend and colleague Anna uh, Friedman calls trans transculturites, who kind of got tattoos on their hands and faces, um, and then when they came back to England, claimed it, that it was done against their will. Probably wasn't, um, but those guys are in the rarity. Okay, so I'm really rattling through this, but um, we have, so that's the kind of, part of the issue, right, of, 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 of why we think tattooing was just for sailors. It's a, it's a kind of set of compounding uh, historiographical errors. So then the next question, I suppose, we, want, we should talk about today is why tattooing is so popular amongst maritime populations anyway, because all of this doesn't obviously disprove that tattooing was very popular amongst sailors. It just sort of suggests that it was maybe a bit more broad. Um, and there's a lovely quote from a, a book about sailor handicrafts, not about tattooing, but about... Um, about things like embroidery and carving, uh, which, which says that sailors cannot leave their mark upon the sea. And um, I think that's a beautiful way of understanding this, right? Like, there's a lot of um, crafting coming out of sailor uh, culture, maritime culture, and essentially because sailors share means, motive, and opportunity. Um, I mean, even these are um, little Victorian kind of scrapbooks, and you can see included in the stereotypical... Um, you know, sailor practices. We've got not just embroidery, but also tattooing um, as these stereotypical sailor practices alongside laundry and cannon uh, breaching and sword fighting. Um, every sailor has a needle um, to darn socks and sails. And of course, that's one of the key ingredients to make a tattoo. Um, sailors also have access to soot and gunpowder, uh, the things that you need to make tattoo ink with. And so in a world where paper is scarce or non-existent, um, where time, uh, particularly when the winds are not blowing, um, is sometimes available when boredom sets in, pricking marks on your arm um, is quite easy. You have everything available to you. And the other thing, of course, is that sailors, like lots of other populations, um, including public schoolboys and professional league footballers, um, come together through from often very disparate backgrounds and have nothing in common, but uh, have to develop very rapidly an affiliation for one another as teammates or, or, or crewmates or whatever. And tattooing has this interesting, um, almost paradoxical idea that it makes you... Um, uh, one, so you can get an affiliative tattoo. You, you and your mates are kind of getting tattooed to feel like you're sort of brothers in arms, so to speak. But at the same time, if you're somebody who has to wear a uniform, it allows you to distinguish yourself as an individual against the hierarchy of the system in which you find yourself. Um, so that paradox of tattooing, where it simultaneously can be affiliative and antisocial, um, is also one of the kind of interesting facets of tattooing in, in, in maritime contexts. Um, and if we look at the kind of visual history of uh, British uh, here, maritime culture, we find a lot of direct crossover between tattooing. And one of the key things I come back to a lot in my work is that tattooing reflects the visual cultures from which it emerges. I mean, it's not surprising to art historians, um, right, that people... Uh, 
are interested in particular kinds of images and that those images move between media. Um, but that is something which tattoo uh, history and, and tattoo scholarship has not paid very much attention to because it's been primarily interested in the sociological and med medical uh, and psychological aspects of the practice. But if you look at the kind of things that sailors are making in other media, it is basically the same as tattooing. So, you know, embroidery, for example, here, um, tobacco tins, this from uh, 1782, and we can see, you know, these really nice, um, for example, these little pierced hearts and these suns, which reflect even those little sketches uh, that I showed you in the criminal and sailor records, and of course, um, moons and anchors as well. Um, Things like this, carving in tobacco tins, would also be done with your needle. So we have uh, some diary, art, uh, diary entries from sailors who talk about, um, you know, using needles to, 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 to etch and to scratch and mark surfaces, wood, metal, um, coins like this, love tokens, um, uh, and also to mark uh, their bodies. And again, so these are, these are called love tokens. They're basically... Um, uh, coins that are worn down to a flat surface by constant abrasion and then um, engraved by hand. Um, and again, the design histories of these is, is, is very, very um, coincident. I wrote a whole article about this called uh, back in 2013 called um, uh, Things of the Sea uh, for the Sculpture Journal, which explains this argument in a little bit more detail. Um, but again, I hope you can sort of see the point that I'm making. I mean, we can even go back to this... Um, tattooed mermaid, uh, and this coin and this mermaid are roughly coincident. And you can see, of course, that there's this obvious coincidence. So um, th I think thinking about one of the kind of clicks for this early on in my career, through conversations with people like Gemma and Anna and others, was that um, if you look at tattooing as an art historian would do, and you think about its visual and technical process of production, you start to see it in different terms to, to the sociologist. Um, uh, other things, of course, scrimshaw, uh, the, the, the carved um, uh, whale bones and, and, and bits of uh, swordfish, tusk, etc., also have this similar coincidence, I think, between um, uh, technology, between the needle or, or, or the awl and the, uh, the visual product. Um, and again, like very, very similar in composition, in detail, in theme, because of course the people who are aboard ships want to tell the stories of their lives, they're surrounded by um, these stories, they are representing their life world. Um, and so then in the last section, uh, I want to then talk about like how that then becomes following these, these coincidences in the 18th century, how, how this becomes um, what we might call a style. Uh, and this guy uh, is the man who I alluded to earlier, who coined the, uh, that phrase, life plus six months. Um, I could do a whole talk about him. He's very interesting. He was a literature professor at DePaul University in Chicago um, in the 1930s. He got fired, um, partly because he hated his students. Um, uh, became in the end a uh, uh, partly in the end became a tattoo artist because he was very, very attracted to hot young sailor boys. Um, and as he got older, found it harder and harder to pick them up. So he was like, how can I meet hot sailors? I will become a tattoo artist. Um, he's one of the most important figures in the history of Western tattooing, and I love the fact that, as I said, he was a um, uh, literary professor at DePaul. The New York Times called him at one point the future Henry James. He was an incredible novelist. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, thanks, thanks, to, thanks to tattooing, we got him instead. Um, so, so this idea about about the sailor tattoo sort of becoming a style, um, again, happens very early on in the development of professional tattooing. Um, there's two, two things that cause the establishment of a professional tattoo industry in this country that make basically rich people who want to pay money to get tattooed um, interested in getting tattooed in the first place. Um, one of them is the tattooing of George V, future George V, and his brother Albert Victor in Japan in 1881. Um, stories got back um, that they've been tattooed on their faces, that they've got big black anchors on their noses. Can you imagine what British history would have looked like had George V had a big anchor tattoo on his face? Um, but um, very quickly, word got back to the palace that actually it turns out this, it was just they had some mud on their faces and it was all misreported. But um, nevertheless, both princes went um, and got tattooed in Japan uh, on their next stop. 
Um, this is perhaps at least one tattoo in London claimed that this was the dragon that was tattooed in Japan on George's arm. Um, Japan had been closed off to the West uh, for about 250 years, up to the 1850s, and um, when it opened up to, to sort of global scrutiny and trade, um, tattooing was part of the repertoire of Japanese arts that Europeans were very, very uh, fascinated with. Um, and actually, every royal visitor to Japan, from the Duke of Edinburgh, um, uh, Alfred in uh, 1869, right the way up to Edward VIII in 1920 uh, odd, were tattooed. Um, Edward VIII wasn't tattooed actually. He wrote and said he he, he didn't fancy it, but uh, everyone before him, uh, we know, was tattooed. And of course, this becomes a part of the mythology of the sailor sailor king George V and and of the royal family more generally. Um, and that, um, that headline, right, the habit not confined to semen only, is um, around the time that this professional industry is really booming um, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Work here by um, a, the man who basically was the first professional tattooer in London, a guy called Sutherland MacDonald, who was tattooing on German Street out of the Hammam Turkish Baths uh, from about 1880 to about 1938. Um, and... His client base were a sort of motley mix of sons of MPs, uh, lawyers, uh, minor aristocrats. Hugo de Bath, Lily Langtree's um, husband, was tattooed by him. Um, and essentially, his patronage was on the back of people who wanted to ape these royal, uh, uh, royal habits without having to go to... Japan, and of course, the New York Times are very interested in what's happening in London, as are the kind of New York, um, you know, social set who want to ape British royalty. Um, New York tattooing itself, this is um, roughly coincident in New York, a guy called uh, Samuel O'Reilly, is a bit more sailor-oriented, a bit more down at heel. Um, O'Reilly, uh, inventor of the electric tattoo machine, was tattooing in the Bowery uh, from, again, around about 1880. Uh, many more sailor clients than, than um, McDonald would have had, um, including you know, young guys like this with scenes from the American Navy. There's a whole chapter in my book about his slightly unfortunate habit of tattooing teenagers. Um, uh, but you know, even he boasted of a much more diverse client base. Um, and even in Japan itself, Right, um, Japanese tattooing responds in kind because when European sailors are in Japan um, wanting to get tattooed, often they are getting by Japanese tattooers things like this. This is from uh, a Japanese artist sketchbook from 1907 from Nagasaki. Um, really, this incredible kind of hybridization of styles. I'm, I'm writing about these at the moment. Um, and so, essentially, that early moment of royal patronage mixed with the fact that many of the tattoo artists who began to work professionally had been in the army or the navy um, ended up with this kind of ossification of styles um, and particularly as print culture developed uh, and as mass production of design sheets became more popular through the late 19th and early 20th century um, the design language of tattooing became kind of ossified into this style um, on the left here is a, um, a World War I era sheet from a, an artist called um, Alexander Gordon, an American who was working in England. And on the right, uh, a work by, from the 1930s by a German tattooer called Karl Rodemick, who trained uh, as a por porcelain painter before becoming a tattooer in Hamburg. Um, like absolutely incredible um, work. Um, again, both of these artists boasted of a more diverse cl client base. Um, in fact, if you look at um, Gordon's work, you can see this very sort of specific sailor material. Um, Gordon's work, uh, this is in this banner, for example. Um, my zoomer isn't working, but we can maybe point out some of these details. There's obviously a lot of maritime things in here, um, but also a lot of things which nod to these Orientalist uh, tropes, but also things like, if you can make it up here, like jock things for people who are into the, the GGs, you know, like little racing horses and greyhounds. Um, Something for the uh, wealthy clubman set, um, and the hunting, shooting, fishing, sporting set, as well as the sailor set. Um, and then I think this is probably where I'm coming to the end. Um, this sense of style really, really becomes locked in, I think, um, into the 1940s, into World War II. So 
uh, Tattoo has begun to sell mass production design sheets um, uh, starting as early as the uh, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century. But again, as, as mass production and, and global networks became more um, developed, essentially there's a very small number of tattooers in Britain and America selling design sheets around the world that then other tattooers were drawing upon. Um, and of course, the, the sheer fact that lots and lots of people were uh, shipping off overseas, um, going through places like Chatham, this is Charlie Bell in Chatham, or going through Waterloo on the train, um, becomes, you know, it means that tattooing becomes very, very kind of anchored again, pardon the pun, with, with uh, tattooing. Um, uh, so, uh, of course, the other thing that makes tattooing very useful if you're, being, you know, you're at sea or you're being shipped away is you can't lose it. Right? If you have a locket or a, a precious artifact, a memory, a photograph or a letter or something from your sweetheart, um, it risks being lost or destroyed or confiscated. Um, your tattoo um, you know, is immune mostly to those uh, things. And they make very kind of, as, as well as, of course, the metaphorical sense of, 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 of the embodiment, uh, make them very useful moments of, of shared romantic exchange in, in the run-up to wartime. And so what that means is, you know, during World War II, lots and lots of sailors were tattooed. Um, this is Joyce Derrick, a 16-year-old girl tattooing in uh, Bristol in the 1940s. Um, and, yeah, and of course, what's also happening, though, is styles are changing. So um, that generation of, 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 of customers are getting more uh, what we might call sort of old-school stuff today, stuff that's fatter lines, brighter colours, quicker to produce, uh, largely as an artefact of the kind of print culture of the period. With um, th th those previous Victorian and Edwardian tattooers that I showed you, their, their print sources that they were drawing upon were largely engravings and etchings and electrotypes. Um, these uh, tattooers, this is by a guy called Cap Coleman from Norfolk, Virginia, uh, in the 1940s, his source material is things like comic books, which have big fat black lines to prevent misregistration of the, um, of the colour plates. And so tattooing begins to take on this more graphic comic book source because that's the kind of thing that his customers are reading and bringing to him. And then you end up with things like this, uh, this great little Popeye over here. Um, so, um, yeah, and over the, over the course of the, the 20th century, as I said, that really becomes... Yeah, you know, as tattooing becomes um, more visible over the course of the middle of the 20th century, we end up with all of the tattoos that are visible being sailor tattoos. Because actually, if you think about it, if your king was tattooed or um, your bank manager was tattooed, you're not going to see it. They're not rolling up their shirts, taking off their shirts at work. Um, tattooed Victorian women, Edwardian women were not rolling up their uh, well, rolling up their skirts, you wouldn't see their tattoos. But the tattoos you would see are on people whose sleeves are rolled up. So this association, which had been kind of brewing for a long time, really becomes set in stone, so to speak, in the aftermath of World War II, when the predominantly visible tattooing in the Western world is that of the sailors returning home. Um, here's uh, Phil Sparrow. I love, this makes me laugh so much, because as I said, he was extraordinarily gay um, in a beautiful and brilliant way. He uh, had sex with over a thousand people um, and was one of Kinsey's key studies for the sex life of the human male. Um, but this is how he's advertising. The, girl, the girls will go for the man with a Phil Sparrow tattoo. Do they? Do they? Right. Um, so, um, so then um, I think this is where I'll finish up, because uh, this is my last couple of slides. Um, what that means is that tattooing becomes, you know, encoded with all of these things that are already encoded with sailor culture of rebelliousness, of bravery, of romance, of, re of kind of re you know, roguish recklessness, and, and, and also kind of you know, hyper masculinity. And therefore, it becomes very, very early on a useful um, uh, set of tools to appropriate if you're a fashion designer. Uh, or an individual person, I suppose, who wants to communicate those things. Um, most excitingly of all, I think, Elsa Schiaparelli, um, Parisian fashion designer, included embroidered tattoo designs from Le Havre in France on her 1929 swimwear line. Um, so these, again, are over 100 years, nearly 100 years old. Um, purportedly, at least, by her account, they were copied from um, designs drawn by real-life tattooers who worked in the French ports. Um, but you can see, you know, Schiaparelli, a very sort of famously and interestingly transgressive knitwear designer, is drawing upon these tropes and all of the kind of associations, all of those things that Melanie Phillips is worried about uh, in order to, to kind of sell transgressive uh, swimwear. 
And of course, we see a lot of that, right? Like, for example, Jean-Paul Gaultier uh, in the 1990s is doing something similar. Um, and even like right up to the present day, someone like Harry Styles, um, fashion, you know, fashion icon, is still playing on these same associations because it's become this sort of slightly self-fulfilling prophecy. And I've been talking to the media about the fact that tattooing has not been just for sailors for over 100 years, for over 10 years myself now, and they still come out every single day. Um, so I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my career, but um, hopefully now I can share the pain, and when you guys read that headline, um, you can wince as well. So thank you very much. You've heard, you've heard me talking about that for a long time, Gemma. Yes, but much updated yeah. and filled out with a lot of detail that is actually new to me. I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, but yeah, we've, we've been conversing about these themes for a very long time, but coming at it from slightly different perspectives, I suppose. Um, you do you remember, you messaged me. I, hadn't didn't, even, I didn't even PhD. have an academic job yet. <laughs> And there was a woman on BBC's coast who was... I'd gone down and recorded some stuff for a thing they were doing about maritime tattooing, and they stole my script and didn't credit me. And you messaged oh, me when yes. it was on telly. And you went, yes. there's a woman on telly stealing your stuff. Yes. <laughs> and that was like... That was in 2012, something? Yeah, God, that's going <laughs> back in time. Yeah, so I'm struck by um, a, lot of, a lot of the themes and power that you talk about were kind of paralleled in the same kind of concerns that I've been working with, but where your focus has been more on um, iconography, um, kind of uh, the relationship between um, visual culture, iconography, and particularly in the context of British and American art, yeah. um, I've started out looking at collections of preserved tattoo that came from France. And so it's a slightly different context, yeah. but you still see a lot of these similar um, trends and themes. So I, I too, am very exercised by this <laughs> um, trope um, that Melanie Phillips has exemplified in that, in that article. Um, because w what it does is it reinforces that presumption that tattooing is something degenerate, yeah. ultimately. Um, and in the context of the work that I ha had been doing around the time that we met on the collections of preserved tattoos, these collections came from um, a criminological context, essentially. So forensic medicine, um, exploring the tattoo in terms of what it can reveal about the psychology of the tattooed. Yeah, the, um, the dermal diagnosis. Exactly, the phrase yes. Goes, yeah. Reading the surface of the body to understand um, what, is, what is, is going on underneath that is, is in some way a threat. It's a threat to kind of Western civilization. Um, and it's essentially pathologizing the working class. That's what it comes down to. So, you, yes, if you focus on yeah. prison populations, you're going to see a lot of tattooed prisoners. But with, even within those subsets, which skew the data that we do have, unfortunately, historically, this is what we have to work with, yeah. um, you see a lot of very innocuous designs that actually turn out to be related to trades. Yeah. And it's just a coincidence that someone might have ended up in prison or ended up in the army, um, but actually they've got insignia or, or symbols that are marks of different types of trades, which often are also physical trades. Yeah. So yeah, what's more I, interesting to me is this relationship between the body and yeah. people who use um, their, their physicality in a, a kind of very raw way to earn their living yeah. and marking themselves. Yeah, I, I, I say in, in, in my book, like, at least I could not conjure a stereotype of a tattooed blacksmith, right? But you find in the record sets, like, anvils and things like yeah. that, right, which are indicative, just one example of many of that kind of thing, um, where the, the, the stereotype becomes, I mean, it's completely, I said it's completely um, 
invulnerable to 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 to, to counter examples, completely invulnerable to counter examples. Because you and I have been doing this for a long time, and it's yeah. still it's still completely <laughs> embedded. Um, and I think, yeah, the point you make about the kind of corrosive effect on wider discourse is really mm. important. I mean, one of the things I didn't go into detail about, of course, was the criminology, criminological context of this as well, where, as you know, of course, the, 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 the practice of criminology begins with an idea that tattooing is something that separates civilised from non-civilised people. Um, and, and that whole that whole house of cards that begins in the um, middle of the 19th century is built on a sort of misreading of that exact record set, right? Exactly. Yeah, and um, it also emerges from a colonial mindset. Because, yeah, exactly. You know, the, the anthropologists who were very much influencing the early criminologists before they were criminologists um, were observing these tattooing traditions of in, indigenous peoples that they were colonising and associating that with a kind of um, uncivilised yeah. context and then seeing similar practices in Europe, the only way they could make sense of that was to say, well, it must be a criminal mindset when it comes yeah. to white European men. And that was a real, I mean, over the course of the, the, the past sort of decade and a half, that was a real like, thing that I wrestled with for a long time, which was like, how did, how did those centuries of knowledge about um, uh, you know, antiquarian tattooing, ancient world tattooing, and then even tattooed people from the Americas mm -hmm. coming to Europe, including, as I said, like in the weeks before Captain Cook set foot in Tahiti for the first time, how did all that in the space of less than a century become forgotten? And of course the answer is it's, it's not forgotten. It's that the rhetorical utility of the tattoo as a marker of otherness or similarity has changed yeah. over the course of that period. And I, th I think that moment as well, that sort of like that, that Cook moment, <laughs> which has come to define the, this idea of the tattooed sailor in the West, particularly in, in Britain, perhaps. Yeah. I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that Britain, as a colonial um, power, very much has associated itself with the strength of its, of its navy, of its navy. ships. Yeah. And so that, I can see how that would be the narrative that ends up becoming the popular one. Yeah. And the, I mean, the French example is different, right? Yeah. So, you, again, you know more about that than I do. Yeah. So. Yeah, so the, fr the French, the, the s <laughs> there are parallels. They're yeah. similar to us in a lot of ways and very different in others. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the subset of tattoos that I was working with, as you know, um, is 300 preserved tattoos, um, that were purchased in Paris, but have had been collected over time um, from cross France. Very interestingly, kind of reproduce a lot of the um, iconographic categories that Ira Dye yeah. writes about. So that kind of rationale, way of sort of thinking and categorizing tattoos is actually adopted and, re and continued through the scholarship. And what you end up with then is people who are um, looking for certain types. Yeah. So I, I, dis I would distinguish between the criminologist and the, and the criminalist. So if Alphonse Bertillon, who is the person who sort of came up with the mugshot and this mm. idea of trying to identify people um, by their tattoos, um, he was interested in individual like how the mar how the marks um, can be used as as identifiers the criminologists were more interested in what they said about the criminal this idea of the criminal and so you get these very like different perspectives that don't necessarily speak to each other yeah um, and you get the criminologists looking for these particular categories in the po in the populations they're studying so you do see quite a lot of sailor marks. You do see um, a lot of kind of quite aggressive, stabby, yeah. <laughs> um, violent, vengeful phraseologies. You get a lot of patriotic slogans, particularly in France, you get a lot of patriotic slogans. Um, and there's a little bit of an obsession with like the se sexual tattoos as well and where they've been put on the body. But then oddly, you get these 
very, very detailed. Um, Do you want that? Very, de very dis Hold down the top button to... Oh, here we go. Yes. So these, these are two halves of a hole. You can probably make out this design here at the bottom. It was one scene. You've got a woman sat at a table. Um, it's been preserved this way probably um, because of the way the body was autopsied post-mortem. Um, I don't know if you can see, but there are two nipples. There's one here, sort of on the end of the elbow, and then on this side. Um, and this, this is really important in terms of how the iconography of this design works. So we're all, we're all familiar with the dagger through the heart tattoo. We usually see it today as a heart with a, a knife in it. But um, in the 19th century, it's much more common to see a hand gripping a dagger and it's ha the placement on the body is, is all important to kind of convey that symbolism. Um, but and anyway, I digress. This particular um, preserved tattoo um, from one, the body of one man is quite unique in terms of the artistry, the design choices. Um, this is definitely an early professional who yeah. also happened to be a soldier, it turned out. Um, but criminologists were writing all kinds of nonsense about this, these particular tattoos. They were fascinated by the designs, but they were making completely you know, onerous, um, erroneous, and, and quite onerous, yeah. <laughs> um, statements about them. So, for example, I think Jacques Delarue in his book is saying, says that, you know, the first of the, his loves lies truly and forever on his chest, while the second took this sort of more passionate, intimate place, just purely because the design is closer to his genitals, right? Um, so, so we get these kind of strange interpretations, but then it turns out, there he is, that's a photograph of the guy, so you can see the full extent of the tattoo. Uh, here we go. So this is, this is the source. It's a, it's a milk advertisement. Baby food ad. It's yeah. a baby food ad from a British newspaper as well, which is quite interesting. So this like, relationship between print culture and like, popular imagery yeah. has been there from the very beginning. This also, by the way, mucks up Egyptology for about half a century <laughs> because French Egyptologists are finding lots of tattooed mummies with tattoos around their abdomen and like they must be sex workers they must be concubines for the king uh for the for the for the pharaoh because the only people that have tattoos in 1920s france are um are sex workers which also itself isn't true either but um that they took this logic and applied it to the field of archaeology which 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 egyptologists it's still today are wrestling with right mm -hmm. it's just incredible yeah yeah i love this i lo that was um the, 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 when you found this by accident, right? By accident, yeah. I was, was, I was watching TV. So I was watching <laughs> um, Hidden Dangers of the Victorian Home. Susanna Lipscomb. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Talking about um, milk and the milk glass milk bottles that you can't clean very well. And this was just you know one of the adverts that popped up on so the screen. Good. And um, yeah, I just I recognised her. <laughs> jumped up and said, "It's her!" And then had to had to find out whether advert had come from but yeah I think this particular person who is the only person who I've been able to kind of map any kind of biography of as a, as a person um, has lots of these kinds of tattoos so as you say you mentioned designs being drawn from broadsheets that's yeah. exactly what he has yeah. um, and even more exciting maybe than the milk advert is this um, political quite anti-Semitic, actually, scene um, of the degradation of Dreyfus. So this is an uh, engraving from a painting that was published in Le Journal Illustré. And here he is, again, being talked about with this, ta this um, design on his back. There's so many, <laughs> there's so many layers <laughs> in this, in terms of like images in images in images. And it's very self-referential. But this is the tattoo on his back. So we know that he, they're, they're talking about this, the, same, the same guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when 
away yeah. from the microphone. Mm -hmm. You had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned a collection. Is it 300 mm -hmm. uh, specimens? Mm -hmm. Yes. Are they all dry, or do you have to keep them in some sort of solution? They're all dried, yes. They're all um, they're using various techniques. So some are like parchment, some are a little bit more like leather. Um, there's no con real consistency there. It's not a generally a skill set that um, medical professionals would have, and it very likely was prison doctors, pathologists, criminologists who would have a sort of rudimentary, you know, understanding of that kind of preservation. Cover them with glass or something? Um, well, if they've been on display, they generally end up being kind of packaged in a Perspex box. But no, they're actually stored... Um, li yeah, loose in containers, just separated by um, acid-free tissue. They yeah. were at one point, um, just <clears throat> Tupperware. Tupperware, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a very strange work environment. You go into the archive and you get out your Tupperware, and you know what's what's that? You've got out in, in the research room. Oh, it's you know it's just a few pieces of preserved skin. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a uh, question which has been um, online for a while from Rose Roberto, um, who comments on the uh, source of. Uh, the term tattoo, and the English word tattoo is from ta uh, to, to, to strike, from Tahiti, yes. but goes on with a question. Uh, which animal tattoos were most common after sea creatures? So it's, I think it's kind of animal iconography. And were there trends um, during different decades after the 1880s? Yeah, so on the word thing, um, we actually the word tattoo does exist, did exist in English, does exist in English before that, but it refers to a military tattoo, a drumbeat, right, like beating a tattoo, um, which is also onomatopoeically the same kind of thing, right, to beat a drum, you tattoo, 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 to tattoo in, um, in, uh, uh, in Tahiti, they're using a, a mallet to tap away, so you get this kind of onomatop onomatopoeic coincidence, and when the word tatau comes to England in the late 18th century, uh, very quickly, the, it takes on the, the two English people familiar spelling. Um, so there's a kind of interesting linguistic thing happening there. Um, in terms of the um, the, the animalistic thing, uh, there's a really gr good, uh, interesting data, big data project uh, called the Digital Panopticon. So you can go to digitalpanopticon.org, I think is the URL, um, which was put together a few years ago as an NHRC-funded project by people at the University of Sheffield in Liverpool. And they uh, ingested uh, huge amounts of criminological record sets, so the old, day, old Bailey uh, records, um, transportation records of convicts to Australia that are kept in, uh, in a library in Australia, and some others. And then they used some text uh, recognition stuff and have created, not perfect, but they do, they do give you a sense of how many tattoos are in that record set and what designs are are changing over time. So you can actually go in and play with that and do visualizations. I think um, uh, largely the, the kind of images people are tattooing on themselves uh, or having tattooed on them tend to be fairly sort of parodically either hypermasculine or hyperfeminine. So you get a lot of uh, butterflies and um, uh, very delicate things often on female customers not exclusively, um, and on, on men, you, you often get, um, or, or masculine presenting people, you get uh, like fearsome kind of aggressive beasts. And actually you find that even the way, all the way back, like one of the oldest preserved tattoos in human skin anywhere in the world, in the British Museum, is five, about five and a half thousand years old, of an Egyptian man from pre-dynastic Egypt. Um, and he has a, basically a big bull and a goat like fighting on his arm. So this kind of animal symbology in art more generally, right, and the kind of iconography of, of animals as, as tropes of, of masculinity, of, of power, of um, bravery or acuity or whatever, go back you know, way, way, way beyond these histories right the way into prehistory. And you find a lot of um, indigenous tattoo traditions, for example, the Scythian Pazuric people 2,000 years or so, similarly have these kind of these mystical beasts. I think in terms of you know the, the, the classics, of course, um, particularly after the encounter with Japan, you're having like dragons, snakes because they work very well on the body. Um, 
a lot of a lot of cats and 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 big cats and stuff. Um, yeah, and then and then as you said, like sea creatures, so a lot of a lot of fish and octopus and things. Can I ask about kind of changing trends with mm. colour as well? Yes. That I mean, a lot of the early historical materials yes. appear to be kind of monochrome. Yes. Yeah. And then there is colour, but and then in kind of contemporary tattooing, it's, it's largely kind of monochrome. Yeah, that that's a, that's that that's well. a basically an artifact of people not wanting to look like their parents, right? So you have like <laughs> you have you have generational oscillation in tattoo styles. Um, in terms of colour, so historically tattooing was basically exclusively black, although sometimes red, mm. based on the things that were being used for pigmentation. It was it's very difficult. Um, sort of pre-20th century to find colours, particularly red, that wasn't really toxic. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the birth of the contemporary colour palette is an, art, is an artefact of the professional industry. Yeah. So when tattooing is, is professionalised in Europe and America in the 1880s, those tattooers, in order to kind of stand out in the marketplace, really, are literally popping down to Cornelissons, which used to be around the corner from here, pigment shop that artists use, um, and mixing it up into a tattoo pigment, tattooing themselves with it, and if it healed and didn't give them a terrible toxic <laughs> reaction, they used it on their customers. Um, and then actually that colour palette then got re-exported back to Japan. So if you look at that, um, those, Jap those Japanese ships that I showed you from 1907, most of those designs in those books are black, red, sometimes brown, um, because you can make brown with um, uh, basically like cuttlefish ink, Heels brown in the skin, um, and grey, which is kind of a, a diluted, obviously black wash. Um, yeah, they, these. Um, but most most of this flash is drawn in just those colours, in black and red, grey and brown, because that's all that's possible um, in, in these contexts. But um, and actually, all the way through, right up until the 1980s, even tattooers were very protective of their colour recipes if they had one that worked. And they would be sort of particular sort of trade secrets that they very jealously protected. Yeah, in, in the preserved tattoos, it's you will see red occasionally, um, and it's it tends to be either completely faded out or extremely vivid. Yeah, and the extremely vivid ones are likely cinnabar. Cinnabar, and those those early 16th century sources that I alluded to from um, the, the, the um, Italian bathhouses, they are talking about using cinnabar containing minerals to heal medicinal wound making, and so you can see how well, those so those things are happening. Treatment syphilis traditionally. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both of you. Um, Matt, I had a question for you, okay. uh, which was about, have you, have you come across there's this sort of pattern of the way that the actual practice of tattooing, uh, rather than the tattooed, actually gets represented? And I think it was one of your first images you showed of this sort of sweetheart being yeah. tattooed by her sailor boyfriend. And then there was this Victorian scrap sheet, I think, you showed. And it almost looks like it's this kind of unconcentrating, quite passive activity yeah yeah it was like you know he's sort of just meh he's just doing it and then there's this the scrap sheet i think and i just wondered if there's yeah that just as we see sort of these this iconography being picked up in the actual yeah. tattoos mm -hmm. is there a way that it gets represented so yeah so tat and uh, it's, it is something that tattooists have really fought against in the professional era so um, tattooists began right at the beginning of the professionalization, era professionalization, calling themselves professor, wearing white coats, particularly the Victorian era, trying to sort of medicalize the practice because it, it, it got them away from these cliches, or they tried to get them away from these cliches a little bit. Um, so for a while, actually, that did kind of work. Like if you look at um, depictions of tattooing in like the first decades of the 20th century in Britain, a lot of them are representing the then most famous tattooer in Britain, a guy called George Burchett, who was an old man with a grey moustache who wore a white coat. And there's a, there's a um, couple of films in which tattooing plays a, a role, and the tattooers in there are dressed like him. Um, but in general, that... And, and yeah, so professional tattooers have fought very hard against that stereotype of the sailor with the bucket, you know, in a kind of dirty port, but fairly unsuccessfully. Like, when you see... Um, again, when you see tat tattooers represented in, 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 in high art, fine art, and even particularly in popular culture, cartoons, film, um, 
the tattooer is often taking on this role of a kind of ruffian, the rogue. Uh, and you know, the reality of Sutherland McDonald's tattoo shop in German Street was it was very ornate, very sumptuous, very expensive. Um, he wore a bow tie and a three-piece suit to work. Um, but most of the time when tattooing is being represented, it's to tell a different kind of political, sociological story of, of, of kind of degradation. There's an amazing picture, I should, probably should have included it actually, from France um, from the 1880s, and it's, it's like the most French image ever. It's these two young women in a park, like gambling, smoking cigarettes, and getting tattooed by a, like, this really stereotypically looking French sailor man with a flat cap and a neckerchief, um, as a kind of symbol of like, youthful degradation among, among the decadent, you know, uh, bohemian youth of 19th century Paris. So, yeah, it's something I, I think probably deserves more careful attention, but if you, I think one of the reasons this, this amnesiac cliche persists is precisely because the, 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 the popular culture representation is, is quite fixed. In, I've, I've, I do recall seeing um, in some collections of early tattooists business cards. Yeah. They're very keen to advertise their completely um, antiseptic method. Yeah. Things like that. The, the, and talk about oriental and sporting pictures as yeah. well as the maritime stuff. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, okay, you sure? No, no, it's you. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I just had a question. You kind of mentioned um, how sort of the tattoo was sort of seen as primitivizing mm -hmm. and also like a sign of being sort of un culturally backwards. Yes. But how do you sort of navigate that with the comparison that it actually stems from ancient cultures and sort of drawing on the merits of the Greeks and um, these ancient societies which, you know, are very praised in, in Western society? How do you navigate that sort of almost hypocritical way? Not, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, that is the question, right? And for a long time, the answer in, in academic books published before about 10 years ago, uh, when Gemma and I and our friends started working on this issue, they will tell you, if they acknowledge it at all, that people just forgot, right? Which is okay until you see those examples that I mentioned to you that are from the day, week, month before the Cook accounts happened. So for a long time, that was the way that um, scholars dealt with it. They just sort of, if they acknowledged the pilgrim tattooing tradition at all, or the knowledge of um, tattooed native North Americans, or Roman or Greek tattooing, uh, or you know, there's, there's, the, tattooing is mentioned in every canonical history of Britain, right? William um, of Malmesbury, William, uh, William, Ca uh, William Camden. Um, it's mentioned in Marco Polo, who talks about marking on um, uh, people in, in what we would today call Vietnam, uh, amongst other places. So it's very, very clear, even if you just have a very cursory knowledge of the early modern uh, historiography, that tattooing was known about by um, Anglophone and Francophone and um, German um, scholars. Part of the issue is that we didn't, don't have the word yet. That's exactly right. So, so actually, one of the issues is that it doesn't resolve to a singular word. It doesn't get called tattooing until the Cook myth, which creates this archival lens problem as well. Um, it's called pricking or marking. Or pouncing, even. Pouncing. Um, Painting. And, yeah. And to, and to be honest with you, that has been the sort of work of the last few years for, for, for me and for others to try and make sense of that, because it doesn't really work. And as I said, the answer I come up with, really, when you look at it, is that the, re the rhetoric of colonialism changes. And whereas in the... Um, colonial encounters in, in America in the 15th century require a kind of, these people are just like us, you know. Um, by the 19th century, it's more they're definitely different to us and they must be destroyed. Tattooing is a problem. Japanese tattooing in particular is a real problem, um, which is a whole other discussion, because Japanese tattooing doesn't fit the, um, the, 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 the development. Henry um, Balfour, who was the first curator of the Pitt Rivers, wrote a book called Evolution of a Decorative Art, where he uses tattooing, basically, like, cultures in their infancy are naked, then they develop mark making and tattooing, and then they sort of grow out of it and become, you know, European. So this idea that they live on this kind of, you know, spectrum of, of, of cultural evolution. But when, when Japan is encountered, and we see these incredibly decorative pictorial tattooing that's being done Based on in a literary Japan, tradition as well. Yeah, based on literature, and actually not that old mm -hmm. by the time that the Europeans in, uh, arrive, only about 100 years old at that point, um, that it doesn't fit very straightforwardly in the, in the model. And again, it's a 
talk for another day, but the, the Japanese shogunate sort of sees on that in some interesting ways. And one of the reasons tattooing is banned in Japan um, in 1869, fairly unsuccessfully, um, it has to be said, but was because of that problem. And the Japanese shogunate thought that it made them look non-European, um, and so they, they, they banned it very quickly. Um, but it's, 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 it, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. And Gemma and I have both had conversations with very senior scholars who've advanced these arguments for years. And one of them, hilariously, it, for his, in his books, he wrote a lot for a long time that tattooing was discovered in the Pacific. And when he was called on it, and we showed him this evidence, he, his next book said, although tattooing wasn't discovered in the Pacific, it feels like it was. <laughs> and then went on as if he hadn't learned anything. Uh, welcome to academia. <laughs> You don't get to ask questions, Tom. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, do you think that in the future there will essentially be a death of the Just for Sailors myth? Because historiographically we've moved past the point where militarization and representations of the military are very common in people's day-to-day -day lives. Mm. And now people much more associated with rock stars, Justin Bieber, Instagram influencers. So like in... 50, 60 years' time, will it be a case of we'll be digging up the bodies of influencers and saying, you know, it's just for influencers? <laughs> yeah, well, like, you, see, so you see a bit of that, right, when, when bikers get introduced into the story uh, in, the, in the 80s, 90s. I, I think I would have said, right, when I started out this work, and we started out this work, and talking about this stuff publicly uh, back in the 2010s, I think we assume, you know, naively as young scholars, like, well, we've told you the truth now, that everything will change, and people will learn. But this is very, very, very persistent. And tattooers, and journalists, and, you know... Everyone has been talking about this for uh, over a century. It hasn't gone away yet. So maybe... Um, I naively thought so. The longer... It, the, 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 the more I get, like, in my... Every single day on my news feed, this cliche, um, the less convinced I am of that. And as you, as you know, Tom, we've had conversations with tattooers who also say it. You know, we have people who've been tattooing for 10 years going, well, before I got into it, it was underground. It's like, it was in Selfridges, mate. Like, what are you talking about? So I don't know. But also, I think, to finish that thought as well, uh, as a tattooer told me really early in my career, tattooing itself, and this is this question of style, sort of works. And um, it's, it's kind of cultural uh, shorthand of I'm a rebellious individual with a romantic and, and non-conformist heart. Like, that's part of the reason people get tattooed, if it's, whether it's true or not, true or not. And so um, one, tattoo, one tattooer said to me, like, you know, don't stop telling people that aristocrats got tattooed because I make money on teenagers thinking it's cool. Um, and there's definitely some truth to that, right? Mm. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, no, I, I think... Because you, you've, you've, you've been focused a lot on saying, like, not just for criminals as well. You've had the same yes, conversation for years yeah, as well. Or these people are only criminals because you found them in a prison and put them in this group. They have nothing else yeah. in common <laughs> that you can really extrapolate from. Um, but, yeah, as a, I do think that one of the reasons that people like to recycle these ideas is that it doesn't have to be sailors, it doesn't have to be bikers, but it has to be something that is marginal or dangerous in some way. Yeah. Because there is something transgressive That's about right. tattooing because you are willfully puncturing your skin, you're opening your body surface, yeah. which in itself is kind of dangerous. Yeah. It's, you're being touched by a stranger, you're yeah. messing with your, your place in you're time. you're marking yourself yeah. permanently, which, you know, is both a kind of a personal act of, you know, ownership, you know, marking yourself in terms of affiliation, however you want to see it, just decorating yourself, but it's also outward looking. So you're saying something about yourself and your relationship to the, your community. Yeah. And that is always going to be transgressive to some yeah. people. I think that's actually the takeaway, right, is that even despite this constant, you know, sense that tattooing is more diverse than people realise, ultimately, in, in a Western cultural context, it is always going to be transgressive to some degree, no matter how popular or visible or yeah. quite, quite acceptable it yeah. becomes. 
uh, yeah. you know, not to kind of like get too into the, you know, the anthropology of it, but it's, it's not a practice that it, it's codified in a ritual in a uniform way yeah. in Europe. The, I think probably the most, the closest we've ever had to that is pilgrimage tattoos. Yeah. Actually, and, and, you know, maybe traveling and getting your, your sailors, your tattoo as a sailor or, um, you know, going on your first holiday to Spain yeah. when you're 18 and getting drunk and getting tattooed and, you know, uh, a beachside studio, it, that's, that's your ritual. Yeah. We've, got, uh, we've got quite a few comments cool. and questions online. We're not going to really get through them because time is against us, but we will capture them. It's on questions of religious prohibition right. and picking up on the early kind of terminology or the early sources of tattoo as a term. I would like to introduce one more question, though, mm. um, which is from... It's posted anonymously, um, but I think it was responding in the moment when, Matt, you were talking about hyper-masculinity, hyper-femininity. Yeah. Could either of you speak more to the history of queerness and tattoos? Yes. Um, Matt gestured towards a, towards a bit with Phil Sparrow, uh, yes. but I'm especially curious about queer women. Yeah, so um, a lot of that in my book, um, which I've got brought with me if anyone wants to buy a copy with me, shameless plug. Um, and I do a podcast with my friend Tom over there, uh, and we have done some episodes on this, and we'll be doing some more in future. Because it turns out that queer people, and particularly queer men, and, and basically their desire to network and find people uh, who are into tattooing and also gay, at times when both of those things were subculturally complicated, the networks they created created the modern tattoo world. Um, that's really the story of my next book, is how queer men in particular are at the centre of this um, industry in a way that people are only just realising. Um, in terms of queer women, um, much less visible, I have to say, um, though there are uh, some really interesting um, uh, transmasculine people, uh, including, uh, I, I will use female pronouns for her because she used them for herself, although I think today she'd probably uh, at least be non-binary if not present as a trans man. Her name was um, Joe Carstairs in the 1920s. Joe Carstairs had the luxury of being one of the richest women in the world at the time. Um, she was the heir to the Standard Oil fortune, or one of the heirs to the Standard Oil fortune, and she became a um, powerboat racer, because of course, like, why not? Um, and um, in order, she, as I said, changed her name to Joe. Her name was Marion by birth. Um, she had a very short cropped haircut. She wore moustaches. She dated Marlena Dietrich for a long time. Um, but she also had very stereotypical sailor tattoos on, on display to kind of accentuate and play with these ideas of, of gender presentation. Um, that was in the 1920s. And um, there, are, there are a few examples like that. And actually... Um, Beginning in the 80s and 90s, um, there's a much more straightforwardly visible queer uh, presence of queer women in the industry. Although um, the, the one, the earliest tattoo shop that I found that's ex like explicitly marketing itself to gay women was run by a man called Larry from New Jersey in the 1970s. Uh, make of that what you will. Um, but yeah, I think so queerness and particularly queer men are absolutely pivotal uh, to the Western tattoo industry in a way that um, will become clear if you read, uh, read my book, because um, it's only become clear to us in the past sort of few years as we've been putting this research together. But it's a really important question. And of course, you know, uh, I'm going to talk about this a bit in Painted People, uh, tattooing, because it's so coded with, um, with gender in, in the popular perception, that can be kind of used, you know? Um, you will read a lot of stories of trans men even today, uh, or butch lesbian uh, women using tattooing to, to play with their gender presentation. But similarly, you'll also find trans women um, who were tattooed in a way to try and sort of, by their own account, fight off their femininity. Then when they do transition or try and present to the world um, in a more stereotypically female way, a struggle with tattoos. And there are accounts of psychologists in the 60s and 70s refusing to treat um, early trans patients who were trans women patients who were tattooed because they thought it would be impossible for them to pass as women if they had uh, tattoos. So, yeah, it's a complicated, it's a great question, and thank you for giving the opportunity to clarify it. Well, thank you for that response. And as I say, there are certainly questions, I know there's questions in the room, there are uh, questions online, and we'll capture them and, and, and pass them over to right. you. Uh, the questions in the room can be carried over next door, where there was a wine reception now. Great. 
um, so we can uh, hopefully uh, talk to you a bit more over, over drinks. But thank you. Um, for now, I think we have to call this part of the evening to a close and say a big thank you to thank Matt you. and Thanks, Gemma, Gemma for such a stimulating evening. <laughs>